Okay, so first of all, which of these graphs is the correct relationship for Hubble's law? Okay, fair enough. So sum of A, sum of B, I guess what we actually wound up with was A, right? Um, but the, the result that we should end up with is actually B, that the distance of zero gives us a velocity of zero. So if we were very careful and we had no error in our data set and our trend line fit the, all the data perfectly, then we would actually intersect at the zero. But you're right, what we actually wound up with in our lab result was A. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, what does a linear relationship mean? And especially one with no y-intercept, it means that the velocity of galaxies is directly proportional to their distance away from us. And the slope of that relationship is called Hubble's constant H naught. And um, the currently accepted value for Hubble's constant is 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So that means that if a galaxy is one megaparsec away from us, it's moving at 70 kilometers per second away from us. Um, the book gives this number in kilometers per second per mega light year, but almost nobody else that I know of uses that. So I'm gonna continue using H naught as 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That's what we'll look at in the homework and the quizzes. Um, this is different from the initial value that Hubble calculated for reasons that we'll dive into in a second here. Okay, so um, if I wanted to apply this equation, right? If I knew that a galaxy was at five megaparsecs distance from us, for example, then I should be able to predict exactly how fast away from us it is moving. So that's what it means for this linear relationship to exist is that any uh, increase in distance results in a linear increase in the speed of recession away from us. All right. So um, I'm going to ask you a few chat questions. So go ahead and type into the chat. I'll give you just a short time for each of these. So first of all, did all of the data in your data set fit within the trend? OK, yeah, so there were maybe a few outliers, right? But for the most part, the data that you had um, fit the trend. So what could it mean? Yeah, definitely it could mean a measurement error, right? It might mean that uh, maybe it was one of those dips that was just really hard to find in the data or uh, someone put the box on the right side instead of the left side of the calcium doublet. Plenty of things could have gone wrong in the measurement side. It could actually mean that that galaxy is going at a different speed and doesn't quite fit Hubble's law. That's possible. All right, so there's multiple meanings. It could be, it could point to something in nature and it could point to an error in our methods. So how close was the class value to the currently accepted value? Does anyone write down what that slope was? Okay, 94% accurate. So let's see, the slope was something like 65, is that right? Yeah, 65.803. So if we use that slope, the, the class data set calculated 65.803, we take um, true minus calculated divided by true, and that gives us the percent error. Yeah, it winds up being about 6% error. Okay, so that's not too bad, right? Um, as the lab mentioned, even modern day measurements of Hubble's law varied by about 3%. So 6% for, you know, something that we did over less than a day, not bad. I guess we didn't calculate or collect the data ourselves, so it's underestimating the amount of time it would actually take. What were the main sources of error, do you think? Yeah, some of those spectra were just difficult to read. That was basically the only thing we did, right? Was set the edges of the little bars and get it centered around the line. Yep, I agree. That would definitely be the main source of error here. All right, so um, I want to talk about that error a little bit and acquaint you with the idea of error bars if you're not familiar with them yet. So on some graphs, you'll see a value shown and it'll have error bars along with it. And basically what those mean is that the, the value, the dot generally denotes the most likely value 
for a particular measurement. And then the error bars show the range of possible values. And so this is like, if you have a whole set of observations, then this would be like the average and the standard deviation, if you're familiar with that terminology. Um, but you can just think of the error bars as being a range of possible values. And if you have a smaller uncertainty, less error, then you'll have small error bars. Larger uncertainty means larger error bars. So um, this can be both for y-axis values, but also for horizontal axis values. So when we look at a um, plot of Hubble's law, for example, we're looking at the velocity and the distance, and there's some error in the velocity. And that was you know, the, the error that came from uh, calculating the Doppler shift using the spectral lines. And then there could be some error in the measured distances. So in order to amass a data set to, to produce Hubble's law, Hubble had to use other methods to, um, to figure out the distance in order to, to show this relationship in the first place. And each of those distance measurements has some associated error with it too. So looking at this Hubble diagram on the right, um, does it look like the uncertainties in a galaxy's distance increase with distance, decrease, or don't change? All right, yeah, it looks like they increase with distance, right? The error bars are getting larger and larger as we increase to the right in distance. Um, what about the uncertainties in velocity? What trend do you notice there? All right, I see the most votes for C. That's what I see as well. The, the error bars in the Y direction, the up and down error bars, those seem approximately constant for all the different velocities. So what this graph seems to be telling us is that there's less uncertainty um, and less change in uncertainty in the velocity measurement than there is in the distance measurement. And this is, this is still true today and this is um, what causes some uncertainty in the slope of Hubble's law. It's not that we're bad at measuring redshifts, but we are actually a little bit bad at measuring distances still. So here's um, some of the measurements of Hubble's constant. Um, don't worry about all the labels on the graphs. There are different ways of measuring Hubble's constant. So for example, what we just saw, the spectra that we just measured, that would be similar to uh, measuring galactic spectra using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but there's other measurements that are done. Uh, some of these, the red dots are techniques that rely on the cosmic microwave background, which we'll talk about in week eight. Um, the black dots, I'm actually not sure about what the cosmic flows experiment is and how it measures Hubble constant. Um, the blue is very interesting. This is from a gravitational wave measurement at LIGO. So a completely different technique. Um, but all of these you can see are relatively close to what we would say is the currently accepted value of Hubble's constant, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, but some of these are, you know, have large error bars. Some of them have smaller error bars, but they clearly don't all agree with each other, right? So there's some discrepancy, and this is a, something that people are still researching today, uh, trying to pin down Hubble's constant to greater and greater accuracy. Okay, so Hubble's law is the last rung on our distance ladder because we can just rearrange the equation here uh, to solve for the distance of a galaxy. So for example, if I know that a galaxy is receding from us at 14,000 kilometers per second, then I can say its distance is that speed divided by Hubble's constant. And if I just do the math, the kilometers per second will cancel out and I'll get the distance of 200 megaparsecs. So this is really handy because it's pretty easy to measure the Doppler shift and measure the velocity of a galaxy that way. So then we can just use Hubble's law to calculate the distance. Um, but there's a catch. So the cosmic distance ladder, this is our last rung. And it just so happens um, that some of these depend on the measurements that came before. So for example, when Hubble took his original data set in 1929, um, he only went out to two megaparsecs in distance. So what technique must he have used for measuring distance? Yes, Hubble used the method of variable stars in order to measure the distances to the galaxies in his data set. And then when Milton Hummison joined the team, uh, they continued using variable stars. So this, um, 
you know, the slope that Hubble measured was only as good as the distance measurement that he was using, the method of variable stars. So using more um, precise distance measurements could yield better estimates of Hubble's constant. And that's exactly what the different research teams are doing. So basically everything that's higher up on the distance ladder relies on the methods underneath it, right? So the Cepheid variable stars, they had to be um, calibrated using the parallax method. We saw that way back when, right? And Hubble's law was originally calibrated using the variable star method. So um, any um, updates to distance measurements lower down the chain affect all of the measurements all the way up. All right, so this is an interesting question. Are there exceptions to Hubble's law, right? So I wanna talk a little bit about the exceptions and then talk about the meaning, how we interpret Hubble's law. So yes, the first question, are there exceptions? Yes, there are definitely exceptions. So we already know, for example, that Andromeda is moving toward us, not away from us, right? And more broadly, if you think of a galaxy cluster, the galaxies that are in the cluster are interacting with each other gravitationally. So they're kind of moving around randomly. Um, I guess I wouldn't say randomly, but they're moving around according to all of their initial velocities and their gravitational interactions. So it's kind of like, I like to think of it like fireflies in a jar. The fireflies are moving around inside the jar, but the whole jar is moving away from us. So here's a little cartoon for that. If you've let's say this is us here in our local group and Andromeda is moving toward us. I don't know what all the other galaxies in the local group are doing. And all the other clusters contain galaxies that are themselves moving around within their clusters, but all the clusters are moving away from our local group. So that's the, that's the origin of all the exceptions to Hubble's law. Um, so that really begs the question then, um, why are all the galaxies moving away from us? Why are all these galaxy clusters moving away from the local group? And um, the answer to this question is super interesting and extremely consequential. So the meaning of Hubble's law is that the universe itself, space itself is expanding. So the clusters are not moving away from each other. The medium that they're embedded within space, that's stretching over time. Um, so the analogy that lots of people like to use is, let's say you have some raisins in a unbaked loaf of raisin bread. As your raisin bread rises in the oven, all the raisins within it move away from each other. All right, so the galaxies are just along for the ride as space-time itself gets stretched out. Um, so this is a weird idea, probably. Um, it, it was for me when I first encountered it and has a really, really consequential meaning. It has an important implication. If space is always expanding, then we can run the clock backwards and infer that it must have been very small at one point. So this is what brings us to the idea that the universe started in a singular point. And then from there, um, the Big Bang caused it to start expanding. So um, based on the expansion rate of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, we can actually calculate the time that the universe has been expanding. I'm not gonna show you the calculation here, but um, I'm happy to after class if you're curious. Um, the expansion rate, if you just take one divided by Hubble's constant and you'll have to convert the kilometers and the megaparsecs to be in the same unit, they'll cancel out. You'll end up with an answer in seconds, which you can convert to years. If you do that, then the universe age that you'll find is 13.9 billion years old. So, um, you know, one divided by the speed gives us a time. That time is 13.9 billion years old. And that's what we interpret to being the age of our universe. So that's Hubble's law. That's the connection to the Big Bang. Um, that's what makes Hubble's law probably one of the most important discoveries in modern astronomy. It leads to the field of cosmology and the study of the early universe. Um, this was you know, this is a big deal, guys. 